Across the Obelisk is relatively new, and as such it's frequently compared to other deck building games, mainly Slay the Spire. To be fair, I can understand how the comparison is made, you know, both have deck building mechanics, moving through the map, classes, status effects, and boss fights, but I am here to tell you that they are nothing at all alike. This is because of one simple reason. In Slay the Spire, you're in full control of your deck, building and crafting the perfect amount of sustain and damage, weaving status effects and creating combos. Whereas in Across the Obelisk, your healer doesn't have any fucking healing cards, goddammit. Scott, just do your fucking job. Welcome to Across the Obelisk, which was actually released about a year ago, but it just now hit its 1.0 release, and oh boy is it fun. The main twist is that the game is multiplayer, which is something you don't see very often in deck builders, and it leads to a variety of... interesting interactions. I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll just work. If he spell. doesn't draw a healing. Which yeah. he did. Oh, so I forgot about that! <laughs> oh, that's fine. Uh, hey, hey, Scott. Do you want to explain why our healer only has a 35% chance of drawing a healing oh, no, card no, from no, no, his no, no, deck? No, no, no. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Do you I don't know what you're talking about. explain that? I don't know what you're talking about. Why, why the fuck do you guys have like 40 card decks? What's happening? The story is just a group of heroes traveling across the lands to rescue a princess, but that's not really important. Besides snippets of character stories or brief lore interactions, the story doesn't matter. So let's talk about what does matter, the gameplay. Gameplay consists of four different characters taking turns in combat. Each character has their own skills, either being passive abilities that activate under certain conditions, like playing specific types of cards, or cards that act as abilities, casting enchantments that make effects stronger, like increasing healing or giving everyone a shield when you get hit. You play cards with energy, and you can see the amount that you have in yellow below each character. The green energy is how much they'll be getting at the start of the next turn, and you can conserve energy across turns up to a maximum of 10. Obviously, the more powerful cards have higher mana costs, so it's always good to have as much of it as you can. Speaking of cards, they come in a few different rarities. Common, Uncommon, Rare, Epic, and Mythic. While common and uncommon cards can be found easily in shops and towns along your adventure, Epic and Mythic cards are the real deal, and can only be found as rewards for events or battles. Each card also has a type. These can be anything from attack or defense, to things like mind spell or enchantment. Each card type has some special properties that can usually be modified by items. Each hero on your roster has five item slots. Weapon, Armor, Ring, Accessory, and Pet. Weapons usually modify attacks, like making all of your damage fire or making sword attacks deal more damage. Armor modifies resistances, granting you extra health or applying more block. Rings can do a variety of things, but usually they either grant defensive bonuses or mix up damage, like making all bleed stacks turn into poison instead. Accessories are usually items that give you a healing bonus or discount a certain type of card, and pets are specifically bought in town and play a certain action every turn. This can be anything from a little extra damage to casting a shield on all heroes. Generally, all equipment is helpful in some way, and you can get some absolutely game-breaking builds if you're lucky enough. However, the most important part of absolutely dumpstering this game system is the characters themselves. So you can't just use any card on any character. Cards come in four types, one for each class in the game. As of the 1.0 release, there are four classes with four heroes each. These classes are Warrior, Scout, Mage, and Healer, and each class can only use its own class cards. Keep in mind that while all mages have access to Fireball, every hero also gets their own passives and cards as discussed earlier, making Fireball better on some characters than on others. Now because this release just came out, I really can't find any tier lists for characters out there. So while I explain what each character does, I'll put them on the objectively correct 1.0.1 across the obelisk hero tier list. Let's begin with warriors. Magnus. The starting warrior is a big fucking furry. Honestly, his entire kit revolves around not only tanking but also dealing damage, so it's too bad that he's fucking horrible at both. C tier. Heiner. 
This is not a place of discussion. Heiner is the best tank in the game, and it's by a lot. He starts the game with Taunt already in his deck, and later he shields everyone else when he gets hit. S tier. Grookly. He's all about gaining fury and stacking bleed on himself, which is fine. But he's not a very good tank. He is C tier, but if you play him as less of a tank and instead use him just to inflict bleed, he goes up to a B. Bree. She specializes in thorns, which deal damaged enemies when she gets hit. Incredibly based, incredibly fun. A tier. Next is Scouts. Starting with Adrian. He can either specialize into melee or ranged attacks, and he's okay. B tier. Tholes. He specializes in stealth and poison, and honestly, he's really fucking good. Fun, too. A tier. Sylvie. She specializes in ranged attacks and applying sight. Honestly, I think she's broken. S tier. Now the last scout, Gustav. Frog. Mages, starting with Evelyn. Evelyn specializes in using a variety of elemental attacks, which is really fun, but there's more effective mages for the job. B tier. Cornelius. Cornelius is the fire mage, and holy fuck is he good at it. If you want to make something disappear, he's the man. S tier. Wilbur. Wilbur likes to add energize to people, which is a status effect that increases your energy on your next turn. He's a really good support, and lightning spells are fun. A tier. Last mage, Zek. He specializes in curse spells, and although I really, really like him, he's just okay. B tier. And finally, we have healers. Reginald. Reginald is a basic bitch, but being basic is perfect for a healer, and he's damn good at his job. A tier. Otis. He makes people heal when they hit an enemy. Unfortunately, playing him makes me want to heal the roof of my mouth with a fucking shotgun. C tier. Maluka. She specializes in applying dark that deals big damage after stacking up enough and dispelling debuffs. Dispelling things is one of the best ways to support your team, so she's an easy A tier. Finally, the last hero, Nezglect. He focuses on applying insanity and sight on enemies. Insanity lowers their damage and sight reveals what cards they're going to play. Then he heals everyone based on how much insanity and sight there is on the field. S tier. Instantly. No questions asked. See, Nesglect isn't really a healer. He's a support DPS that just so happens to also heal your party to full at the end of his turn. He is absurdly good. And there you go, every character not only explained, but ranked based on absolute objective fact. No one can argue anything in this tier list because I'm correct and you know it. Keep in mind that I don't think that any hero is unplayable. Even the heroes in the lowest tier have their uses and can become thigh-crushingly broken in the right scenarios. The higher tier characters are simply who I think can break the game the easiest and most consistently. And hey, if you just really like Otis for some reason, don't let me tell you not to play him. Just know that I will judge you for it. Also, I should mention that there's no limit on what heroes can be taken. You're not required to take one of each. You can bring four healers or two tanks and two scouts, whatever your heart desires. Just know that I highly recommend taking at least one healer and one warrior in every party or you're going to be suicidal by act two. Now when you first play this game, you'll probably be thinking to yourself, how the fuck am I supposed to beat this after you get your ass whooped by some random wolf in a forest? But as you dejectedly return to the menu to start a new run, you'll notice this funny little star has a number by it now. Welcome to the perk tree. As you play with characters, you'll rank them up. With each rank, you get a perk point that makes them stronger right off the bat. Deal more damage, apply more status effects, start with more energy, it's all here, baby. The perk tree makes killing sheep go from a four turn ordeal to a one turn skippable cutscene, and it's awesome. The downside to this is that the first few runs will be a grind to unlock and level the characters that you want to play as, but I honestly think it's fun, especially with friends. Not only that, but ranking up characters and completing achievements has a second, far more important purpose. Skins. Every character has three skins, a default, a level 16, and a level 32. 
Each one is obviously cooler than the last, and it's a really cool way to show off your dedication to a character. Not only that, but every character has a special card back as well. There are personal ones featuring their skins as a character level reward, or super cool themed ones for beating the game on various difficulties. I think it's really neat to have skins like this in a game without the need for a competitive online season or a battle pass. It's literally just a show off to your friends, and it's absolutely awesome. Now, since I gave you my tier list a little bit ago, I can only assume you've beaten the main campaign by now. Well done, friend. But now the game has stagnated. Life is boring. Every run results in a victory, and it's not even close. What is there to do anymore in Across the Obelisk? Introducing Madness. If you've ever played Slay the Spire, you'll know this system as Ascension. Madness is a variety of modifiers unlocked as you play that make the game progressively more difficult. These can range from bitch baby to ball crushing in how much they fuck you over, and you better believe that you need just about all of it active in order to get that sweet, sweet Madness card back. Trust me, this is gonna keep you busy for a while. And if that's still not enough for you, we also have the Obelisk Challenge, a fully randomized roguelike adventure where the only thing you get to pick is your starting characters. You don't even have a starting deck, everyone gets to draft cards at the start and select four traits from a limited skill tree. This is honestly one of the best parts of the game simply because you'll fight a variety of enemies with no idea as to what's coming next. This honestly feels a lot more like Slay the Spire and I like that a lot. Now, finally, I want to get to aesthetics, and also cover my legal obligation to discuss a game's music. The first thing you're going to notice about Across the Obelisk is that it looks... Well, it looks like dog water. The graphics are fine, but I personally don't really like the art style. This combined with animations that are sorely lacking any impact makes the game just feel a little... bland, I guess? Keep in mind that I'm a big proprietor of gameplay over graphics, but that doesn't mean that the graphics aren't important at all. I just wish that I had something pretty to look at when I played my cards. On the other hand, the card art is actually really nice. I still don't think that it comes close to Slay the Spire's beta card art, because that shit is fantastic, but all the cards are very easily identifiable at a glance, and that's really important. On to the final and most important point, the music. As much as I would love to tell you that I'll be adding the whole soundtrack to my playlist, I think only one or two songs could make it. The main theme absolutely slaps, and I love it. The problem is that you only hear it for a tiny amount of time, and the other tracks like the overworld theme or battles are all just kind of boring. They're not bad, but I'm certainly not bopping my head to it. Even the big final boss is just a bit slow and lackluster. It's got some cool guitar in it, but it's nothing special. Honestly, with all these recent games having such fantastic soundtracks, I'm a little disappointed. I guess that I've just been spoiled by Project Moon. All in all, Across the Obelisk is a fantastically fun game, whether you play it with or without friends. I would give it one Sneko eye out of the heat death of the universe, and you can grab it on Steam for just 20 bucks. Thank you all for watching, we're almost to a thousand subs, so you better fucking subscribe, and I'll see you soon.